I am a former special agent with the FBI, became a FBI whistleblower, and I brought my concerns about the January 6th investigations being a statistical manipulation about domestic terrorism in the country and heavy-handed tactics to arrest individuals that were associated with that case. Keeping our republic is on the line, and it requires patriots with great passion, dedication, and eternal vigilance to preserve our freedoms. Jenny Beth Martin is the co-founder of Tea Party Patriots. She is an author, a filmmaker, and one of Time Magazine's most influential people in the world. But the title she is most proud of is mom to her boy-girl twins. She has been at the forefront, fighting to protect America's core principles for more than a decade. Welcome to The Jenny Beth Show. Have you noticed how often the federal government is being weaponized against citizens of our country? It seems to be happening more and more often. You may recall Tea Party Patriots was targeted by Obama's IRS. And now the Biden administration is weaponizing the federal government against President Trump, Biden's top opponent for next year's election. My next guest was going to be used as part of the weaponized Department of Justice, but thankfully he said, wait a minute. This goes against the oath I took to protect and defend the Constitution and the training I was given. And he became an FBI whistleblower. Steve Friend is a former FBI agent with more than 12 years of extensive law enforcement and national security experience. When asked to execute orders, he thought violated his oath of office to the Constitution and the training the FBI gave him. Steve put everything on the line to do the right thing. You are an FBI whistleblower. How did what did, what how did that even happen? I think it was uh, almost an accident. Uh, I joined the FBI in 2014. Had a pretty long. Uh, go of it you know, working on Indian country and working on violent crimes and doing SWAT and felt like I was just content to do my dream job. And uh, I always envision the role of anybody in law enforcement as being a system idealist. And the way that we in today's culture celebrate system disruptors, especially coming from Silicon Valley and there's people that are coming out with new and novel and exciting things that are blowing up the status quo. Uh, I think that that doesn't really apply to law enforcement. And the reason for that is that the system idealist is the person that looks to the, the law and the constitution and the policies and puts those first and foremost and it is incumbent on that person to protect society from the system disruptors, from the criminals. And from my perspective, the way that the FBI has departed from its rules is it, it's not keeping with, with the system that it's supposed to be protecting. And I, I had genuine concerns that we, we were jeopardizing righteous cases. I had concerns that we may be generating cases that ha shouldn't be, and we were persecuting people. And finally, I had concerns that we were making the process, the punishment, and using these heavy-handed tactics to arrest people and putting their safety and our safety at risk, almost as if being in a Waco, Ruby Ridge scenario the day before, and uh, felt that I it was incumbent on me due to my training that I had from the FBI and my oath of office that I had to throw the flag and say, we have to stop this. Okay, that was a lot. I want to unpack a, a bit of that. First, let's 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 just talk about you and, and make sure the audience knows you a little bit more. And then I want to get into persecuting and the processes of punishment. Um, you said this was your dream job. So how did you decide to go in law enforcement? Was the FBI your first job? And how do you wind up doing this? Uh, I went to college. I went to the University of Notre Dame and uh, was going to pursue a career in accounting. Uh, after finishing school and doing that for a, a year or two, I realized that that was not the career path for me. Uh, and I'd always had this endeavor to do something in civics, civil service, uh, public service. Uh, I had two grandfathers that were in the military had looked into the military, but unfortunately for me, I'm asthmatic, take medication every single day to this day, and was not gonna be able to pass a physical for that. So then the idea of law enforcement sort of to percolate in my mind because it's serving your community, you're almost deploying every day and then coming home at night, and uh, and looked into doing that. And I'm, I'm from Savannah, Georgia, and there was uh, some openings with the police department there, and so I applied 
and became a police officer there for a number of years. Ultimately, though, uh, my wife, who I met shortly after becoming a police officer, uh, was pushing me to look into the FBI because she thought that you know, that's the the NFL, the highest level of law enforcement, and uh, and I definitely agreed with her and, and uh, put in my, my application, and after four years, was accepted in 2014. Wow, so it really was your dream job, and you felt like you are moving up, and then where did you go? So you were in Savannah, you got a, a job with the FBI, where did you get from there? Uh, well, because of my law enforcement background, the FBI will send is more inclined to send you to a more remote location. So there's 56 field offices around the country, but their territory is so large, they can't really send agents from a central hub. So they'll have these small resident agencies within the Bureau. My first division was Omaha, which was responsible for all of Nebraska and all of Iowa. And I was sent to the Sioux City Resident Agency, which is about 100 miles north of Omaha on the border of South Dakota, Iowa, and Nebraska, all in one area. And my responsibilities there were to work on Indian reservations in Northeast Nebraska, which is a uh, very small and niche area in the FBI. Only about 150 agents are working at any given time. The caseload is voluminous. You, I'd carry about 40 to 50 cases active at any given time. But it also gives you the opportunity to really impact these small, underserved communities and address a violent crime that is all too common there. Uh, and it was a great uh, experience. I really enjoyed it. And the added benefit was in the form of an exit benefit. Because it's so hard to fill those roles, the FBI gives the people who do that an incentive. And if you do that for a certain length of time, you're able to pick your next transfer and make it an automatic transfer, which we took advantage of in 2021. Having come from Savannah, Georgia, we wanted to get closer to family and uh, took the transfer to Daytona Beach in June 2021. Okay, so um, in doing that in Iowa, what kind of cases were you dealing with? And then also, what kind of cases were you dealing with in Daytona Beach? Well, the uh, the Indian country c- crimes are all violent crimes and major offenses. So you're talking murder, sexual assault, child molestation, aggravated assault, the type of crimes that a, just a general violent crimes detective would work. And because of the odd jurisdiction, the way that our federal code book works, those fall to the FBI to investigate. And it's this really bizarre situation where a a non-Native American can commit a crime and the tribal police cannot arrest or prosecute that individual, so the FBI has to. Or a Native American commits a crime, but the tribal court system can only charge him with a misdemeanor. And so I've seen in my time records where an individual committed a rape and got 40 day jail sentence out of it from the tribal court. And th- that's why the FBI comes in and it's such a great assistance to these communities. And it's also got these, these weird quirks where there's no double jeopardy because they're technically a sovereign country. So they can be charged tribally and federally at the same time. But really it what always comes down to is this great liaison relationship that you have with the tribal police or the local law enforcement. And that was always what I felt like was the prime directive of my job in the FBI was to make their lives better, having been in their position. And uh, after seven years there, I worked about 200 cases, 150 arrests, five years on SWAT, was taking a totally different uh, tact of things. And uh, Daytona Beach had a opening for a child pornography and human trafficking investigator which, funny enough, is one of the step cousins to Indian country in the FBI. And it's because you have to liaison really well with locals. The cases are voluminous, obviously. There's just so many of them, it's hard to keep up with. And it's also one of the only two areas where you can beg out of in the FBI and say, look, it's just not for me. I, I can't handle this because of the nature of the, the, the work and the crimes that are committed, uh, that sort of graces afforded to anybody who is who is in that area. But I think that it's a righteous work and, and took that transfer and then I already started to develop some cases once I arrived in Daytona within the first few months and had gotten some arrests and then the news came that I was gonna be 
voluntold to work on domestic terrorism as opposed to child pornography in late September of 2021 when the fiscal year was rolling into October 1. And what what was that domestic terrorism that you were told you would be working on, voluntarily told? Well, in, in my office, we had a, a JTTF, a Joint Terrorism Task Force. It was, before I joined, one agent and two task force officers. And they were supposed to be investigating international terrorism and domestic terrorism threats. Once I got thrown in, I was supposed to be the domestic terrorism guy. And it was pretty apparent that the only thing that we had on the books, for the most part, were January 6 investigations that had already been worked and investigated by our office and were sort of sitting dormant. Um, and just in my experience and my nature, digging into the cases, because I didn't know anything about January 6 before that point. I had really been isolated in what I was doing, um, a big believer in paint the fence, I say. If there's a giant fence and we all have it going through our yard, if I paint the section that's in my yard and you paint yours, this whole fence is going to get painted. And I, I just always was the task in front of me. So looking at those cases, I immediately was alarmed by the fact that the FBI is departing from the way that it runs cases. And from my perspective, having not even knowing the details of the cases, if they're legitimate, righteous prosecutions, could jeopardize our ability to win at trial. And became more educated then to, to find out why, what was the rationale for the decisions that the FBI has made and how it is managing these cases that is such a great departure. Uh, and, and that's really what was the kernel of why I decided to, to come forward with my concerns from that front with my managers. Okay, um, and I want to get into into those details. <laughs> into those details. Let me just get this straight. They took you off of child porn to work on J six. Did they take anyone else off of child porn to work on J six? And you were on child porn and human trafficking. What about taking people off human trafficking to work on J six? No, it was just me in my office who was the only agent. My my office only had about eight people, and when I came in and took that role on basically said, give me all any child porn cases, I'll take them from you, from anybody who had them, because nobody was really doing backflips to work child porn cases. There was a squad of agents that was in Jacksonville, uh, and they were broken down at the end of the fiscal year and reassigned to other priorities. And that's not to say that there aren't other priorities that the FBI should handle. The problem is, and this is tied to the integrated program management quota system that the FBI has for creating its metrics for performance that it then says we're really successful for the year and, and what we're doing. And that is what dictates the number of cases that it's supposed to open and the number of arrests that it's supposed to get for the year and all violations across the board, the, the specific tools that it has to use. And those are all tied to the budget that the FBI has, and then they're also tied to bonus compensation for senior executives in each of the field offices in the FBI. So you're talking about special agent in charge getting somewhere in the area of thirty to $50,000 because his or her subordinates got the proper number of arrests and opened a certain number of cases that headquarters said you need to open and arrest. The bonus people based on the arbitrary number of cases that the FBI headquarters determines needs to be open in any given year, whether crimes are happening or not. Just they decide this is the number you're supposed to open and then they bonus people if they hit that number? Yes, they do. And it's a system that's been 10 years in running going on. It's very McKinsey drafted uh, consulting firm where they're going to rank themselves as gold or green or red. And uh, it creates this perverse incentive structure because human nature is to work smarter and not harder. And January 6th is the most egregious example of this, but just to take it away from that, you have a case where there's say four bad guys that are working together and they're, they're a small terrorist cell. Well, why would I open one case with four bad guys? I should up four cases with one bad guy. And now we have four cases instead of one. And those are the types of number games that go on for the FBI. And it creates uh, a 
false statistical narrative that justifies an ever-growing budget that we see the FBI. They get more and more money sent to their, them every year, and it creates a false illusion for the public at large where there's now this misrepresentation of the actual threat that Americans face every single day. And it's almost entirely derived from this IPM structure. And it's completely turned law enforcement motivations on its head, where the police exist in your town to bring crime down. The FBI exists to bring the crime numbers up. It, it makes sense to have um, metrics and to determine the number of out outputs that you create if you're in a factory and you're creating widgets, but you're dealing with actually the, the law and human beings and their natural rights that are supposed to be protected from the government. And it seems like the government um, with this system, whether I'd, I'll give whoever created it the benefit of the doubt, they probably thought they could take the rules that they apply to management of for-profit businesses and apply it to law enforcement. And it, it would somehow, they could fit the square peg into a round hole. But it doesn't work that way. No, it doesn't work that way. And I, again, give them the benefit of the doubt, you don't want people sitting on their hands all day and just as a government no. employee doing nothing. I, Definitely I understand not. that. But here's another thing too that, that kind of gets lost in the shuffle. It's not just we have to create a certain number of cases. It's, we have to do it in a certain length of time. Now, if you've hit your numbers, now it's time to sandbag. I've had situations where I had a case where there were a number of subjects that were going to be indicted for a crime and was told, well, we already hit our numbers for this year. So delay indicting those people until next fiscal year rolls over so we can apply that to next year because we don't want our numbers to go so high this year that we have to then meet those numbers next year. And then we can really hit the ground running as soon as the calendar flips over. Now you have allowed criminals to walk free for a number of months to commit fraud and force against innocent people so that we could play a numbers game. It's just, it's a little bit mind boggling. And then they get paid to do this. Like they get bonuses to do this, 30 to $50,000 a year in bonuses. In perpetuity for most of them because it, your pension is tied to your highest levels of earning. Now, if you're getting that $50,000 add on to your salary, and you would think that that's towards the tail end of your career once you've reached that level in the FBI, that means that once you retire, that's applied to your pension. So you, we wind up paying for that for decades. Now, you said that in, in um, an example, you could have um, four cases with one bad guy rather than one case with four bad guys. So I guess if there were four people, you could wind up with 16 open cases, four for each bad guy, potentially, in that example? No, it would be, so four, four bad guys, one case, would be the way you would work it. But as other whistleblowers have come forward with that exact sort of situation, they opened up four cases with one bad guy. So they just rejiggered the numbers and then copied and pasted everything they did and put it into four separate files to essentially boost the total by 300%, so four versus one. And then if you're dealing with something like that with say domestic terror terrorism, then you can come out and say domestic terrorism is on the rise in America, but really it may not be on the rise at all. It just appears that way because of the way they're charging and, cases. And that's, that's January 6th in a nutshell. Explain, explain that. You said it was the most egregious example. Well, it should be one case in Washington, D.C. that you could stand up a task force to work because of the size and, and scale of it. However, the way that is being run on paper and the decision was made that they were going to open up a separate investigation for every single person. So now one case has become thousands of cases. Now, what else do they do? Instead of running them on paper from Washington, D.C., which they are doing, there is a task force there that is there, but, eh, they assign them to the field offices where the subject lived. Now, I lived in Daytona Beach. If somebody from Daytona Beach walked into the Capitol on January 6th and was being investigated for committing a crime, we can also question it, is it terrorism or is it trespassing? Because most of the cases for January 6th are parading charges. 
those are criminal. Those are not terrorists. They're being labeled terrorists, but actually by the way that the case label is, is a parading criminal offense. Nevertheless, that individual is being investigated by the Jacksonville Division, which was my division, uh, assigned to the Daytona Beach Resident Agency, Steve Friend, case agent. Now, that's very atypical, very unusual. It is still allowable. I asked why and was told that that was to get buy-in from the field. That question was posed immediately after the decision was made, uh, before predating my time, and the people that were the highest level said, this is to get buy-in. Now, you can interpret that to mean, we don't think you're going to take this job seriously unless your name is on it, which is a pretty macabre view of your workforce. Or secondly, we think that your bosses are going to get bonuses because you guys are going to work these really hard to hit your numbers. Now, we have the illusion that we have thousands of cases as opposed to this one black swan incident that happens and we've spread them geographically around the country. So we can say there's, there's terrorists in D D Daytona Beach, there's terrorists in Jacksonville, there's terrorists in Sacramento. But all those people were individuals who walked through the Capitol. It's not an ongoing terror cell that I think most people believe that domestic terrorism is supposed to represent, that, that blanket term. It's not really accurate to believe It's that. not people planning to fly a plane into a building and kill 2,000 people. Correct, correct. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that they didn't commit a crime that day. I, I, but the, the statistical way that it's being manipulated, I, I've compared it to death numbers in police officers. Now, 1999 and 2000, the numbers were very consistent. 2002, 2003, also very consistent. And then we had this 2001, where the numbers spiked enormously. And that was because we had the attacks September 11th, and a lot of police officers died in the towers that day. Now, for as a country, the total number of police officers in the United States of America jumped substantially. Does that mean there was an additional threat to police officers writ large around the country that year? No. And I think anybody who's worth their salt as a statistician or anybody who is using these to send a message to the American people as a politician needs to be honest about that. So January 6th, I think anybody can agree is unprecedented as it's been labeled. Black Swan incident, as I continue to call it. It certainly is not something that's ever happened before and hopefully never happens again. Mm -hmm. But regardless of that, it's not indicative of a rising threat around the country of a terrorist attack. And now we're back to the integrated program management, which I said has been around for 10 years. There's a reason that domestic terrorism stats have quadrupled in the last 10 years in this country. And it's because of that system. Wow. Now, you mentioned earlier that, it, it, and you you use the system, and, and you were talking about it, and so this is how you wound up becoming a whistleblower. You saw that per, you felt like the FBI was persecuting people, and that the process wound up being part of the punishment. And those were things that led you to become a whistleblower. So w w elaborate on, on that a bit. There was three separate incidents. Uh, I really did very little on January 6th cases before we were going to actually arrest these people because those cases were sitting in Washington, D.C., and they were actually making the decisions on our own cases. So now we're outside of the way that things are supposed to go in, in the FBI. So these cases sat dormant for over a year. Now, the, the two sort of investigative actions that I was a participant in, one was I was sent to interview an individual that an anonymous tip came in the task force did a GPS on his phone, and it came up negative. The facial recognition on his driver's license and his social media came up negative. All we had was an anonymous tip that said, we think that this person was at the Capitol participating in violence against police officers. Now, as a law enforcement experienced person, uh, that's not an easy prosecution, because even if that person says, yeah, I was there, we, we don't have any hard evidence, and we have an anonymous tip. He could just be a crazy person. It nevertheless was told, you have to go talk to him. Otherwise, Washington, D.C. will continue to hammer you that you need to go, you need to go. And I went, uh, knocked on his door, and was very direct because I didn't want to waste his time. Uh, and I said, yeah, I'm with the FBI. We're investigating January 6th. Were you there? And he said, no, that was the day of my son's funeral. Wow. And that is arguably the most difficult day of that gentleman's life, 
no parent should outlive their child, obviously. Uh, and the collateral damage that the FBI is willing to inflict because it has this giant dragnet and it is hellbent on bringing as many people into that net as possible. Uh, that was that experience that I had uh, having that man relive. Secondly, there was another interview, and that was this was an actual individual who was at the Capitol, had gone to the President Trump's speech, had walked over to the Capitol, had asked for permission from Capitol Police to walk inside and was granted permission. Went in, didn't do any damage, no violence, toward the Capitol and left. He was a, a dual citizen, and this was his first trip to the Capitol. And we asked him, did you take anything? Did you maybe a riot helmet or something like that? And he said, apologetically, yes, I took a free brochure from one of the racks that is there and as a memento. And this was a gentleman who was in a lawyer's office, which is not free. He had lost his job. His employer had fired him. He was in the medical field and was at risk of losing his license as a result of that. And again, we couldn't even tell him where he sat with his future because we were not in charge of our own cases. And this is the process being the punishment. He might never do a single day in jail. He might never be charged with a crime, but he's certainly paid a price. And that is not the job of the FBI to inflict punishment. And your name was on the case, but you weren't the determining, you weren't able to determine what what happened. You just were basically assigned, go talk to them and let us know. Yes. We were, is that normally how it works? No. Once, once your name is on the case as a manager or a participant, you have discretion on how to bring that forward. You have the training. You have the same training as every other agent. Uh, we're all professionals. Now, they could have opened that case in Washington, D.C. And, and send a request over it, and we call it cutting a lead, and I would have done anything that they wanted done. But they insisted on it had to be my case. Now, I'm a professional. I've been to trial eight times in my career. That's more than most FBI agents. I've opened up all these cases. I know that there's all these pitfalls that you can run into, and I'm talking about strictly if it's a righteous case that should be brought and charged. If I use the wrong color evidence tape, that is something that a defense attorney will rip me to shreds over. Now, that was one of my concerns that I brought forward. I said, look, I don't care about the success rate in the Washington, D.C. jury pool that is convicting these people. My case that has my name on it will be buttoned up. And I can tell you that we are departing from the rules and we're not saying why in the case. That's a problem to me. That's a due process thing to me. And that was one of my primary concerns that I told my frontline supervisor about when I eventually came forward. And, uh, and that happened in August of 2022. And it was the first opportunity that my office was going to have to arrest anyone for January 6th. And again, this is a year and a half later. And uh, for a while, I just, I guess, self-preservation sat there thinking maybe they won't charge these guys. I, I have some problems with it, but if they don't charge them, then I'm not gonna have to deal with the the due process issues. But then the decision came down that they were going to execute some arrests and search warrants for multiple individuals, large scale arrest operations for people with dozens of agents who were charged with misdemeanors. Uh, the one felony subject, uh, he had pledged to be cooperative when he was interviewed a year and a half before. And we were sending SWAT to his house at six o'clock in the morning. And I was not on the SWAT team at the time, but I did five years on SWAT. I uh, was very experienced with it. And I know that that is an inappropriate use of that tool. Certainly for somebody who says that they will cooperate with you. And now you're gonna come 18 months after the fact and bang on his door at six o'clock in the morning. I don't care what you're accused of. I was an agent at the time, but if you, I hear banging on the door at my house at six o'clock in the morning, it's going to be an armed encounter because I'm a husband and a father and I have a second amendment right. I'm coming to the door with my firearm. I could easily foresee that being the situation here where an individual hears the banging and comes to the door and, and, and you can say, oh, we had a loudspeaker on. It doesn't matter. We can call him on the phone. We can call his attorney on the phone, ask him to surrender. We can have the local deputy knock on his door, which I've done. We can use a surveillance team because we've been quote unquote watching him for a year and a half, which is again, back to the messing with the numbers where these cases sat so dormant that we had to justify having them open. So we would drive by his house on the way home from work and claim we did surveillance. 
we could use a surveillance team to interdict him on his way to work. We were doing surveillance on a gentleman who we knew where he lived and we knew what he did and we knew he wasn't doing anything illegal. We and he already there. said he was willing to come forward and cooperate. Yes. <laughs> and that's when I said, this is, look, look, we just had this Netflix series about Waco. Yeah, I watched it. And It's disturbing. You could Monday morning quarterback that um, all day. And I'm, I'm here and it's Saturday. It's the day before the game, guys. Uh, and I'm telling you that we're lucky that nobody's been hurt. Not our people, not the subjects. We should not be doing this. And I brought that concern to my frontline supervisor, thinking not in my mind that I'm going to become a whistleblower. I, that term is so it's bastardized at this point. Uh, I just wanted us to change course in how we were doing things. And I even said... I'm not comfortable personally with this. Can you assign me a different duty that day? We're doing a wiretap on a drug case. I will sit and man the phones that day, which is an awful experience. You sit there for 12 hours on a phone and wait for it to ring. And was told, you're the domestic terrorism agent. You can't get out of this. Um, and this was August 19th. The arrests were going to happen on August 24th. Talked to my frontline supervisor, first name basis. And he said, you got a great reputation. You, you're going to ruin your career over this. Are you prepared to do that? And that was when, my, I guess, my na naivete fell away, where I thought, I, this is my training. I'm doing my job here. I'm not asking to rock the boat that much. I want us to do the right thing. And uh, he said, take the weekend and think about it because this is going to cause harm to your career. And uh, it was a Friday. Spent the weekend and came in Monday morning, and I said, thought about it and prayed about it, and I'm comfortable with where I stand on my position. That's going to be up to you. And he immediately called the next level of the supervisor, and I was summoned the following day, so the 23rd, the day before the arrests, to go and talk to two assistant special agents in charge in my division, uh, who are the second in, in command. And that was Colt Markovsky and Sean Ryan. And we had a sit down meeting where I showed up. And prior to that, um, I thought this is probably gonna be a bad experience for me going forward. Um, and I think that they're gonna try to compel me to commit a crime. I think we're violating people's civil rights. And that's not acceptable to me. And they're also going to use whatever they can to destroy my career. Talk to a a certified law enforcement officer in the state of Florida because Florida is a two-party consent state and said, am I allowed to record this conversation? And I believe I am, but can you confirm that? And he said, you're a law enforcement officer. You believe there's a crime being committed. You might be violating policy in the FBI, but you can record this conversation. And I went in and for about an hour, an hour and 45 minutes, had a conversation with these two gentlemen and expressed everything that we've been talking about. And heard multiple times within this conversation where they said, you can come forward, but you have to do what we tell you to do. So you're refusing to do your job, right? Right. And I kept saying, no, I'm following my training. I've been giving this order, which is in violation of my oath of office. My oath of office supersedes this directive you're giving me. And was told that the people on January 6th killed police officers multiple times. They they said that, and I was told that you have an oath of office, but you have a duty to the FBI, and you have to follow orders. Um, and at the end of that meeting, sort of said, look, I don't know where I stand with this, but I've laid it all out for you, uh, and wh where do we stand here? And was told, look, this is the federal government. Anything that happens is going to be a long time in coming. We'll be in touch. I said, look, if you're going to fire me, just had me turn my gun and badge in at my desk. Don't make me drive an hour and a half to Jacksonville to be driven home by you guys because you've seized my vehicle. And they said, oh, ha, 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 Steve, don't worry about it. Well, three hours later, I got an email from, from Colt Markovsky, and it said, you've refused a direct order. You are to be stay home tomorrow, and uh, you are charged with being absent without leave. You're commanded to be AWOL and not to come to work. So I didn't go to work the next day. And I uh, went back to work the following day. Now, my 
the special agent in charge, the third level of my chain of command, met with me on September 1st. Again, we talked about all the, my issues. She told me that I was a conspiracy theorist, that I represented a fringe minority within the FBI, and that I needed to do some soul searching to decide if I wanted to be part of the organization going forward. And um, at the conclusion of my meeting, she said she'd already referred me to the FBI's inspection division, which is like its internal affairs, and the security division, which assesses your <laughs> security clearance. And uh, that's when I knew the writing was on the wall because the FBI has found the hack around whistleblower protection, and that is the security clearance. They can suspend your security clearance for just about anything, not your whistleblowing, but they will find a way to do it. And once your security clearance is suspended, you're suspended. You're still employed, but you're unpaid, and they leave you there in purgatory while they quote unquote investigate for as long as it takes you to resign. And the process becomes a punishment. Yes. And ultimately, I was suspended indefinitely, September 19th, so one exact month from coming forward. And the rationale for my suspension was uh, my refusal to attend the uh, arrests, which I was ordered to stay home, so it's not really accurate. Uh, I was called and told to attend a security awareness briefing and which I asked if I could bring my attorney. I had an attorney at that point, and they said that I wasn't allowed to. And I asked, could they give me documentation that says I can't have an attorney that I could give to my attorney? And then I would come, and they said they would, and they never followed up. They suspended me a day or so after that. And then the third reason was, and I will, I'll plead guilty. Um, I improperly accessed the employee handbook. You're, you, you improper, how is that improper to access the employee handbook? Isn't that available to all employees to look at? Yes, it's an unclassified document that's housed in a classified system. And uh, my attorney... The employee handbook is held in a classified system? Yeah, we, which you would think might be a compromise system once you go in there to check out what the rules are for taking paternity leave or something like that. Wow. But I, I accessed the handbook and uh, used a jump drive that they said was an unclassified jump drive on a classified system, which was a violation of policy, which it was. And I would ordinarily expect to get an email that says, don't do that again, Steve. But it was a blank jump drive that the FBI gave me to investigate child pornography. So I assumed that it was safe to use. And why isn't the, why in the world isn't the employee handbook available uh, otherwise, why does it need to be in a classified server? Is all are all government documents on a classified ser that's server? That's a that's a large problem. I, I can only speak to the FBI. Yeah, that all of these administrative human resources assets, all all this paperwork is housed on a classified system, and you have to be in an FBI space in order to access it. And there's all these restrictions attached to it. Even to enter your timesheet is on a classified system in the FBI. So every two weeks when you send that in. You're essentially compromising the system to document the hours of work that you perform. What if you're an employee who doesn't, are there people who don't have classified uh, clearance working there? No, everybody has the ability to access that. We call it the red side, the classified system. You know, it might not be the, the top secret, but you okay. have to go into a SCIF to access. Uh, but you, th that's back to the security clearance. You have to have a security clearance to work in the FBI. Okay. So... They have the document on a classified server and they use this, you looking at an unclassified document as one of the reasons to suspend you. Yes, and those are the three reasons. Um, they walked me out and gave me a packet and said, you can apply for uh, outside employment while this process plays out. And at that point is when that was the, the first sort of step in the long train of abuses started to happen, where you would think it would be the, the end, but uh, within a matter of weeks, my, my wife mysteriously lost her job from an industry that's uh, pretty regulated and has a lot of connection to federal government. Uh, her Facebook account was uh, completely suspended, permanently suspended for violating community standards after she sent a private message to somebody that said that she was my wife she sent a message to a woman from Moms for Liberty and said that I'm Steve Friend's wife. Can you share his message? The, somebody at the FBI gave my medical information to a journalist at the New York Times, 
and then also told them that I was under investigation for shooting a firearm in my backyard. The Was that true? No. no. Okay. Um, Your medical records? Yes, they told the, uh, the New York Times that I was unvaccinated against coronavirus, which is true, but they shouldn't be disclosing that to a journalist. Um, beyond that, the I, I requested copies of my training documents. I was looking into doing some sort of private investigator work or maybe law enforcement in Florida. I need those. They refused to give them to me at first, which is by the Privacy Act. They have to give them to me. They said I had FOIA on my own re records, but I was told if I put a FOIA request in that I, those were law enforcement sensitive documents that they couldn't give me. Um, when they eventually did give me some of them and I submitted them to the state of Florida, the state did its due diligence and contacted the FBI and said, are these authentic? And they said, we can't confirm or deny those papers. So they made them essentially useless. The security division had me participate in a compelled interview with them to assess my security clearance. I was allowed to have an attorney and he was not permitted to give me any guidance in, in the interview. Uh, and during that time, they accused me of committing a, a felony of the two-party consent violation in Florida. They accused me of inciting violence because I wrote a, a column, which Cheryl Ackeson published on her website, where I said that this was a rhetorical call to arms for my fellow civil servants to uphold their oath of office. And they said that that turn of phrase was an incitement to violence. A rhetorical call to arms is an incitement of violence. And, uh, and finally, I put in multiple requests for outside employment and was denied. I was told that it would take about uh, 30 to 60 days, uh, maybe up to 90 to make a determination. And uh, it was one business day and that was rejected. Wow. Um, at which point did you realize you were a whistleblower or that you were going to have to become a whistleblower? Uh, I, so what I've come to learn is I almost unintentionally fell into becoming a whistleblower. Going to your supervisor in your chain of command with a reasonable concern is a whistleblowing activity that is protected. Okay. Now, I did it out of just trying to do the right thing. So when you said, I don't think we should be going in there with a SWAT team that inadvertently moved you into whistleblower status. And, and I made it more formal after the fact. Um, after my suspension, my attorneys who are whistleblower attorneys had me draft an actual written disclosure that I submitted to the uh, Inspector General, the Office of Special Counsel, to the House uh, Judiciary, to the Senate Judiciary Committees. So it's gone to multiple receiving parties that are all within the 5 U.S.C. 2303 law that is drafted for whistleblowers. Okay. Um, and so all of these things happen to you. You're, you're employed now, right? I resigned on February 15th, the morning of uh, my deposition for the weaponization select subcommittee. Uh, my attorney said at that point uh, that they were actually concerned the FBI would drive away to ch charge me with a crime. If I accepted a position I was offered um, and without resigning in the FBI that they would maybe try to contrive something, which is also what they try to do in the security division where they asked me about my audio recording and it was very clear to me that they wanted to get me in a lying to lacking candor with a federal agent felony where I would say no and then they would come to my house with a search warrant and arrest warrant or something to that effect but when I answered honestly yes I had they really didn't have very much to other than to say well that's a violation of policy <laughs> um, but yeah I, I resigned that morning and took a, a fellowship with the Center for Renewing America uh, advising on domestic intelligence and security services. So you were without employment for about four and a half months? 150 days. And your wife also lost her job during that time? Yes. So that, that had to be very tough for you. How were you feeling? Uh, what were you guys thinking during that time? You know, we had a little bit of a runway lead into that because of the, the vaccine mandate that came from President Biden Executive Order 14043, I remember it. Um, and we made the decision that we that I wasn't going to get vaccinated, none of my family members were. Um, and I, Which is a good decision to make. <laughs> yes, I like very much not not have blood clots. Yeah. Um, and I said, they the way that they were making us a test and 
seek exemptions to me was obvious that the FBI was developing a registry of unvaccinated employees to target, which is precisely what's been going on since then. So I told my wife, there's going to come, a, there's a likely a chance that I'm not going to be working for the FBI. And, and we made financial arrangements that would ease that stress. So we had a little bit of cushion there, but yeah, it was definitely a stress. We were without paycheck um, and, and I have two small children and it's not cute to be unemployed and married to an unemployed person when you're in your mid and late thirties, as it is maybe if you're in your early twenties where you can kind of just couch surf on mom's in mom's house. Um, but you know, we knew we did the right thing and, and, uh, we had a little bit of outreach that was financial. That was, was great that, uh, the, the cash Patel charity reached out and, uh, gave me a $5,000 donation around Christmas time. That's good. And, and that was one of the things that was brought up during the committee hearing that I had been bought and paid for by Cash Patel, a Donald Trump lieutenant. Um, I've never met Cash. He. Uh, it was charity. It was charity. Uh, I, I, I have um, <laughs> been in that situation under much for much less glamorous reasons um, at Christmas time, and friends stepped up to make sure I was able to give my kids Christmas and, and I, to buy food. If I. If you think that I gave up a very lucrative dream career in the hopes that somebody who I've never met several months later would give me an amount of money that does not equal one month's pay from that organization, I think you're fooling yourself. And, and I was certainly, I'm blessed to live in a country where people are charitable like Cash's organization is. But as a, a man who promised his wife at the altar to always take care of her, that's, that's a tough pill to swallow. Yeah. But we made it through, um, and uh, I was able to gain employment with, with Center for Renewing America. And my wife actually recently started doing similar work in, with another company. So we're, we're back on our feet, and, and certainly better off than uh, other, other people, I think, who have traditionally and historically whistleblowers have just been crushed by the federal government. It's hard to fight the federal government whether you're a whistleblower or unjustly persecuted or targeted by the IRS, it, it costs enormous amounts of money to, to fight them. And they know it. And, and that's, that's really where their, their strength is. In my sort of response to them in the last nine or 10 months, I kind of feel like a mosquito where I'm flying around this giant animal that can just swat me away. They're not very good at swatting away. They're, they're like the, the big stack at the poker table. They just have a lot of money and they can just push in and push out all the players. They're not really good at poker. And I, I've sort of joked that I'm a mosquito and they keep smacking themselves in the face as I fly around them. And they, they can't seem, they're not nimble enough. They can't seem to catch on to what's the points I'm making. And, and the points that I'm making are that the organization is completely broken and these are very obvious to large swaths of the American people. But the people that continue to exist within that ecosystem are either wholly bought in to the, the woke, weaponized FBI as it's presently constituted, or they're willful or ignorant to it, or they're beholden to a paycheck, or they're saying, I'm just following orders. Wow, Steve, that's, that's pretty amazing. You just said you think the FBI, the employees um, are, are woke and weaponized. We hear that online all the time, but it's something we haven't really quite covered yet. And along with just going along or being ignorant. Um, so I think we need to elaborate on that more and talk about the solutions that, that you have. I think this is a good spot to end for this episode, and then we can resume in another episode with you, Steve Friend, on The Jenny Beth Show. The Jenny Beth Show is hosted by Jenny Beth Martin, produced by Kevin Mooneyhan, and directed by Luke Livingston. The Jenny Beth Show is a production of Tea Party Patriots Action. For more information, visit TeaPartyPatriots.org. If you like this episode, let me know by hitting the like button or leaving a comment or a five-star review. And if you want to be the first to know every time we drop a new episode, be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications on whichever platform you're listening to. If you do these simple things, it will help the podcast grow, and I appreciate it very much.